Good afternoon, folks. This is the second half of our epistemology science lecture, which we can discuss tomorrow. I think um, probably going to meet at 11. I'll send out an email. Um, this is where we got to. Yeah, we were talking about naturalism and whether it's um, got a, a problem or not um, with, with the ideas of knowledge and particularly with logic. Um, anyway, let's move on now to Quine and um, his sort of uh, take on the relation between epistemology and science. So Quine is a pretty famous guy in analytic philosophy, 20th century, um, known for a number of things. He rejected logical empiricism. Um, basically, uh, well, I won't go into all these things right now. Uh, he also rejected the analytic synthetic distinction that we will talk a little bit about today. Um, he also had a thesis called Indeterminacy of Translation. Um, yeah, you might have heard about that. Um, in philosophy of science, he's known for the Duhem Quine thesis, or maybe the Quine Duhem thesis. Anyway, Duhem had a thesis first, and then uh, about how uh, theories can't be sort of tested e experimentally in isolation, but only um, in conjunction with other theories, something along those lines. Anyway, Quine made a similar claim. And what we are mostly talking about today is his uh, naturalized epistemology and what he means by that. Okay, let's uh, carry on then. Okay, oh, I'm just gonna turn the video off too, you don't need that. All right, um, yeah, so, is the Stanford Encyclopedia entry talking about Quine. Um, basically, this is his view on um, epistemology, but it seems to be in uh, his view about philosophy generally, that, uh, as it says here, Quine denies that there is a distinctively philosophical standpoint, which might, for example, allow philosophical reflection to prescribe standards to science as a whole. Um, basically, um, there are no special methods of philosophy, no special sort of vantage point on the world that philosophers have. Um, there are only scientific methods. Um, only, as it says here, those standards of evidence and justification which are um, used in the natural sciences. Okay. Um, that gives you some idea about where Quine's going to be coming from on this question. So, yeah, there. Um, so I mentioned that Quine was a critic of logical empiricism or logical positivism. And so let's say a bit about that because it provides a bit of a background for what he said uh, about science and epistemology. So uh, we know what empiricism is, and I think Hume was perhaps our best example of an empiricist. That is somebody who thinks that um, all of our knowledge and all of our concepts come from experience only. There's no a priori knowledge, there's no a priori concepts. Um, all uh, ideas are uh, copied from sense impressions, that kind of thing. So logical empiricism is a 20th century version of empiricism where they mixed um, empiricism with the recently uh, discovered or invented symbolic logic. Frege, um, created first order logic towards the end of the 19th century and in the early 20th century it was discovered by people like Bertrand Russell and from there you know became <clears throat> quite widely known among analytic philosophers. So the idea was to do empiricism more rigorously by using uh, symbolic logic, first order logic as a tool. Um, so one way in which um, symbolic logic can help to make empiricism more rigorous is um, to clarify this distinction that Hume uh, made between relations of ideas and matters of fact. So um, at first sight, empiricism, the claim that we get all our knowledge from experience, um, doesn't um, fit our experience of mathematics, that is, um, in, in mathematical knowledge, we don't seem to need any experience. We get that knowledge through reasoning, through proving theorems and things a lot like that, you know, finding counterexamples and so on. Um, so Hume's response 
is that um, mathematical knowledge is in a sort of different domain from scientific knowledge. Mathematical knowledge is just relations of ideas. And even though we can learn it using reasoning, it's not really substantial knowledge. It's only, um, as it were, relations between ideas or um, it's just saying things like all bachelors are male. It's, it's true by the meanings of words. It's true by convention, something like that. Okay, um, but this, this distinction between relations of ideas and matters of fact is a bit unclear. And um, other philosophers, notably Kant, tried to clarify it. Uh, Kant had a distinction between um, analytic and synthetic statements, which is um, an attempt to clean up Hume's distinction here. And, um, you know, Kant's uh, definition is also not uh, very rigorous and funnily enough puts mathematics on the synthetic side of the divide and not the analytic side. Um, and so the logical empiricists thought that you can use symbolic logic to define this distinction more rigorously and get the line in the right place. In particular, the analytic statements are those that are going to be sort of formally valid or um, if you've taken logic with me, we'd call them first order first order necessities, um, things that, uh, statements that are necessarily true by virtue of their logical form, something like that, okay? And synthetic would be truths that are not analytic in that way, okay? Um, so that was the idea. Um, they also thought that uh, analytic sentences, which included mathematical truths, uh, were just merely true by virtue of uh, conventions of language. He didn't express, you know, real or substantial truths about the world. Another key feature of logical empiricism was this um, verificationism uh, or the uh, verifiability criterion of meaning. Um, and this was particularly um, used to um, distinguish between um, meaningful or, you know, Basically, it was used to get rid of metaphysics. I, I think I might have mentioned at one point Hume's fork that said, um, you know, if, if a piece of work, if a book doesn't contain either mathematics or um, things that can be, um, you know, the fruits of empirical research, then it's, uh, you can might as well throw it into the fire because it contains nothing but sophistry and illusion, okay? Um, so, the uh, logical empiricists wanted a fairly clear criterion that would tell them whether a book or more, more reasonably a sentence statement was something that uh, deserved to be taken seriously as a meaningful statement, even if false, versus just a meaningless piece of gobbledygook, just sort of blah, blah, blah. And um, they thought that the meaningful statements were ones that could, at least in principle, be empirically verified. So, for example, uh, logical empiricists were no friends of the theologians. Uh, theologians might say, for example, that God is love, um, and the verificationist would reply, well, that's not even false, okay? Um, tell us the experimental conditions under which we can verify that God is love. For example, you know, um, if we sail a ship, uh, if we set set a ship, um, uh, or we bring a ship from A to B, uh, presumably if God is love, then the ship won't sink. And the theologians, oh, no, no, you know, God moves in mysterious ways. We can't really um, assume that the ship won't sink just because God loves us, and so on and so forth. So it doesn't seem that there are any conditions, no any sort of experiment you can do that would verify that God loves us. Um, and therefore, it's, it's not even false to say that God loves us. It's just blah, 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 uh, just meaningless uh, gobbledygook, okay? So anyway, that's a little rundown of logical empiricism. Um, and uh, the, the group of uh, philosophers that put this forward, well, the, you know, not, these are not the only philosophers, but the main ones, uh, we're in this Vienna circle or Wiener Kreis in German. Um, 
So they developed this view of logical positivism or logical empiricism, same thing. And they met, you know, basically in, during the 1920s. And there are some pretty big names there, Schlick, Carnap, von Mises and Neurath. Okay, and they were sort of like uh, satellite members as well. People who were associated with them, although not technically members, maybe just because they didn't live close enough to attend meetings, but uh, Reichenbach and the uh, British guy, uh, Freddie Ayer. Alfred Ayer. Okay. Um, so, yeah, these are pretty well-known people uh, in 20th century philosophy. Now, let's talk, talk a bit about Carnap, because uh, Quine, in this paper that we're looking at, uh, Epistemology Naturalized, he mentions Carnap quite a bit, um, and particularly this book called The Aufbau, um, or more fully, uh, Der Logische Aufbau der Welt, um, usually that's translated the logical structure of the world, although Aufbau is the usual word for uh, construction in German, so you could read that as uh, the logical construction of the world, um, which in some ways makes more sense of his project. But anyway, um, it's a kind of Kantian idea, at least it looks that way to me, um, that the so-called external world that is the world of uh, objects with properties and, and relations and so on. We've talked about this when we discussed Putnam last week and his um, reason, truth, and history, his internal realism. Um, that the external world is, is not just uh, sitting there independent of us uh, with all of those, with all of that structure in it. Um, it's kind of um, that, that structural component actually comes from us. It's constructed, as it were, from human concepts or human categories. All right. Um, and, you know, uh, Carnap was an empiricist. He was one of the, uh, the Vienna Circle. Um, so the idea is that we start with um, elementary experiences, um, particular experiences of particular things being a certain way, um, but not, not external objects, but just um, things in the mind. Um, and a little bit like phenomenalism, I guess, um, maybe even a lot like phenomenalism. I don't claim to be an expert on the Aufbau, but um, it certainly seems like phenomenalism is the idea that um, the external world is sort of a construct out of these elementary, elementary experiences. And you can do the construction using Frege's symbolic logic to make it all really uh, nice and rigorous. Okay. Um, now, we saw that uh, phenomenalism was a very difficult project to carry out, um, particularly sort of identifying a material object, an external object with a um, set of possible experiences of it. Uh, you know, there's just so many different ways in which one can experience an external object that it's going to be very difficult to, you know, reduce uh, the object to a set of possible experiences or something like that. Anyway, uh, I can't claim to have read the Aufbau, but the, the general consensus on it, and, and certainly Quine agrees with this, is that it's kind of a heroic project uh, that ended in failure. Okay, it just really can't be done. Okay, so in this paper of Quine, he dissects the failure of the Aufbau, and um, helpfully he distinguishes two different sides to the project. Um, it kind of correspond to how um, we said with Hume, it's not just um, concepts that come from experience, but knowledge. So uh, there's a similar distinction here that um, if you're sort of reducing scientific statements about the external world to um, statements about experience, then first you have to give the meaning of each sci scientific sentence in terms of experience, and then you actually have to um, show those sentences to be true as well. Um, in other words, you have to prove them. You have to give the meaning and then you have to show that it's true. So he calls these the conceptual and the doctrinal projects. Um, okay, so um, now one of the most interesting things for me in this paper, and this kind of goes back to our uh, week of talking about empiricism and rationalism is how firmly Quine is um, sort of wedded, I would say, to empiricism. Okay, so 
Quine acknowledges that Carnap's empiricist program in the Amphibal completely failed. Um, but nevertheless, I'm going to read this out from Quine here. Nevertheless, uh, two cardinal tenets of empiricism remained unassailable. Not just, you know, somewhat plausible, but unassailable, okay? However, and remain so to this day. One is that whatever evidence there is for science is sensory evidence. We, science is based on experience and experience only. The other to which I shall recur is that all inculcation of meanings of words must rest ultimately on sensory evidence. Um, so both concepts and uh, knowledge come solely from experience, just as, as Hume claimed. Um, right, and that's why the, uh, the Aufbau was, uh, you know, an attractive project, okay? Um, it's interesting how um, easy it is to maintain um, firmly such ideas that seem to be um, just unworkable. Anyway, um, so here's the, the sort of the key move that I want to talk about in Quine's argument. So um, Carnap was trying to do this obviously impossible project of trying to um, derive statements about the external world that go beyond observation um, from statements that are purely observational. Um, now, you know, we, we talked about why that's impossible. You know, logically, you can't get from things that have been observed to things that haven't been observed. The, the content of the conclusion definitely goes beyond the content of the premises. There's no way you can make that inference. Anyway, but Carnap was trying to do that, and of course, he failed. Well, uh, what should we uh, make of that failure? Here's Quine's idea, which is certainly a good point to bring up. Um, the brain is doing this uh, inference that Carnap wanted to make using symbolic logic. The brain is doing that inference all the time. You know, the, the brain's visual processing system is constantly turning these sort of two flat um, images of the world taken from slightly different perspectives, you know, the two different eyes, and it's constructing from that the visual field, the three-dimensional visual field. All right, that's where we get our, um, you know, T-Rex model that turns its head and all the rest of it um, by, this, by this inference. That, that uh, case of illusion is clearly one that went wrong, but in general, this is a pretty reliable inference. Okay, so how does the brain do it if, you know, Carnap couldn't, as it were? Um, well, you know, Quine's idea is rather than trying to do this rational reconstruction, why, rather than trying to figure out logically how it's possible, why not just see how the brain does it? Um, well, that doesn't seem like a bad idea, you know. Um, rather than, for example, trying to figure out how a bumblebee would fly, which maybe seems impossible to us, let's just um, look at the bumblebee more closely and see how, see how it actually does it. Um, yeah, so the um, conclusion then of Quine is that since epistemology as traditionally understood is a failure, we should just, we just, just stop it right now. Um, we just give up on that project, fold up our tents, go away, um, and, you know, do science instead. Here's what he says. Um, Philosophers have rightly despaired of, of translating everything into observational and logico-mathematical terms. They have despaired of this even when they have not recognized as the reason for this irreducibility that the statements largely do not have their private bundles of empirical con consequences. And some philosophers have seen in this um, irreducibility, the bankruptcy of epistemology. Okay, so there's a little reference here to the Quine Duem thesis that I mentioned before that um, theories can't be tested individually against experience because to get predictions out of a theory you need to use other theories so theories kind of um, face experience um, together not individually you might say anyway um, it's interesting how he argues then for the bankruptcy of epistemology that just that some philosophers have, have seen in this um, obviously not much of an argument there as far as it goes um, also you know if we look actually at 
uh, let's say, perception, uh, visual perception, and ask a scientist, you know, how does it work? Um, it seems to me, from at least the little I know about this, and again, I'm not an expert, that scientists are now telling us we have a lot of, um, what should we call them, um, innate, um, innate cognitive structures that um, combine with the data uh, to produce this um, three-dimensional visual field. Okay, so, you know, it, it seems that science actually is telling us that empiricism is false. I mean, maybe that's going a little bit too far, but it certainly seems that science is pointing us in that direction. I mean, if that's true, then um, we can make two conclusions, I suppose. One is that, um, you know, Quine's basic idea is right, that maybe epistemology can sort of get a boost from, from science or at least some clues, some um, information that will set us off in a new direction, hopefully a more profitable direction, but also that um, maybe we shouldn't give up on that rational reconstruction. Um, the kind of rational reconstruction that Carnap was, was going for was kind of burdened by empiricism and seems to have been clearly impossible from the outset. Um, if we, however, sort of get rid of empiricism and, and maybe phenomenalism, if it was also settled with that, if we get rid of these uh, kind of crazy ideas, um, then that project of rational reconstruction maybe can continue. All right, think about that tomorrow. Um, yeah, um, it's interesting that, uh, again, he's um, very committed to his premises, even though they seem to lead nowhere or to lead to, um, you know, the idea that we just can't even get knowledge of the world, um, a sort of a self-defeating conclusion. Um, he says, should the unwelcomeness of the conclusion persuade us to abandon the verification theory of meaning? Certainly not. Um, and here he has some premises that are relevant actually to his uh, claim of the indeterminacy of translation. Um, basically that argument is that um, if you imagine a so-called radical translator, that is somebody who parachutes in um, to let's say the, you know, the Amazon jungle or some language group which is completely unrelated to any language that the, um, the translator already um, speaks or understands. Um, so he's working absolutely from the ground up. And he quite assumes that the only data he has is the uh, behavior of the uh, people that he's studying. You know, so he, he hears what they say, you know, he can write down these sounds um, and he sees the context, all right? He sees what they're looking at, pointing at, what is present in the environment and so on. And Quine shows, and I think correctly, that um, given only those um, observable things, the translator cannot logically figure out the meanings of what the people are saying. It's rather similar to in science, how you know, the data alone don't um, give you any probabilities for scientific theories. Um, but then uh, it just seems to be another case that shows that we have more data than just experience. Um, for example, we have brains ourselves that are similar to the brains of the people that are talking. And so that enables us to, as it were, filter out certain possibilities and make others more likely in terms of what they could mean by a certain uh, statement. Anyway, but Quine is not budging on this. Um, he's quite convinced that empiricism is true. And so, um, that gives us the verification theory of meaning. Um, and again, you know, based on things that he's uh, <laughs> completely uh, not willing to budge on, surely one has no choice but to be an empiricist, so far as one's theory of lingu linguistic meaning is concerned, even if that leads us into nonsense, uh, like the indeterminacy of translation is, is basically nonsense if you, if you study it. Okay. All right, now um, let's look at how Feldman responds to Quine. Um, so, I mean, this doesn't address by any means all of Quine's argument, but um, I think there's a good general uh, response here that um, just because certain kinds of extreme claims uh, fail, 
according to Quine, and he's, he's probably right that they fail. Well, he is right. Um, it doesn't mean that there aren't sort of more modest versions that um, can succeed, right? Um, uh, I don't remember where Quine actually mentions uh, Cartesian foundationalism in that paper. Perhaps he does. Um, but let's say, you know, Cartesian foundationalism fails, which it clearly seems to fail. It doesn't mean that other more modest kinds of foundationalism don't succeed. Um, and more generally, if uh, just because an empiricist attempt to solve, solve the problem of induction fails, or it fails to provide what he calls a rational reconstruction of scientific, uh, in, you know, scientific inferences, um, it doesn't mean that uh, there is no such rational reconstruction of science. Um, you know, there could be a, a rationalist reconstruction, for example. Um, now, he also seems to uh, accept some of Jagwon Kim's criticisms. I want to talk about Kim in a moment, uh, of his criticisms of Quine. So Kim points out that there's um, a big difference between traditional epistemology and the kind of scientific approach that Quine recommends. Um, so Feldman says the two fields study strikingly different topics. Now, if that's true, then of course one, one field, psychology, cannot replace the other, epistemology. Uh, it would be as if, you know, we're having trouble studying, I don't know, chickadees, and um, then the proposal, uh, the, the solution to this is to study um, crows instead or something. Well, you know, <laughs> one, one study can't replace the other because they're studying different things altogether. We could study crows till the, till the end of time, and that wouldn't really tell us much about chickadees. In a similar way, um, Kim and Feldman are saying that, um, you know, we could study psychology till the end of time and know a lot about the physical causes of belief, how A leads to B leads to C. Um, it wouldn't tell us anything at all about whether those beliefs are rational or, or justified, whether they count as knowledge. So, um, you know, psychology cannot replace epistemology. Um, okay, well, let's see how uh, Kim argues for this. Kim's paper, at least uh, maybe a, a brief, um, shortened version of it is on the website. Um, here's the claim that uh, Feldman was just talking about in his Jaguar Kim. Um, if justification drops out of epistemology, knowledge itself drops out of epistemology, which obviously is uh, kind of a contradiction because epistemology is supposed to be uh, the study of knowledge, okay? Uh, a concept of knowledge is inseparably tied to that of justification. Um, yeah, so uh, this sort of non-normative naturalized epistemology that Quine is promoting um, is not really epistemology at all, it's, it's something else. Um, now, Let's look at um, the kind of um, role that um, an empirical science like psychology might have in um, the study of epistemology, okay? So uh, Kim starts with uh, Philip Kitcher as somebody who's an epistemologist who um, thinks that, you know, we do need to pay careful attention to psychology. Okay, um, in other words, we should sort of um, not merely look at, you know, um, uh, we, we shouldn't just define justification in terms of logical relations, um, like A is evidence for B and this kind of thing. Um, relations like positive relevance or, you know, probabilistic relations, things like that. Um, but we should now pay much more careful attention to the actual, you know, processes in the brain that produce belief, um, you know, in the actual psychology and neuroscience and whatnot. Now, we've been doing this already. Um, you might have uh, realized, uh, might have thought about this already, that with um, the externalist theories, reliabilism, for example, process reliabilism, obviously you are defining uh, justification in terms of the reliability of causal process. So, um, Kim says here, 
that uh, Goldman's um, proposal um, to explicate justified belief as belief generated by a reliable belief forming process, you know, this is um, what, what Kitsch is talking about in a psychologistic approach. Um, so now we define justification in terms of causal or nomological, that is, um, connections provided by the laws of physics. So, you know, for example, the, uh, the, the connection between um, heating a metal and the metal expanding, you know, metals expand when heated, that's a uh, nomological connection, a connection provided by physical laws as opposed to some sort of logical connection. I mean, heating a metal doesn't sort of logically entail that it expands. Um, okay, you need to know the laws of physics. Um, yeah, so this is, um, a, you know, a, a good kind of um, use of psychology in epistemology, according to Kim. Um, the worry, though, is that if we accept psychologism along these lines, as uh, Kitcher does, for example, and it seems that Goldman does, maybe we're losing normativity. Um, now, normativity, remember, is um, this aspect of things where you say not just what's happening, but whether what's happening is kind of good or bad, whether it's um, whether it's right or wrong, whether it's um, you know, something we should evaluate positively or negatively. So, you know, justification is a normative concept because uh, if a belief is justified, that's a good thing, right? And if it's unjustified, it's a bad thing. So also truth is normative. A true belief is good, false belief bad. Warrant is normative. Knowledge is normative. You know, knowledge is good belief, I think I said right at the start of the course. It's some sort of positive evaluation of something, of a belief, uh, to call it knowledge. All right. Um, so, um, so Kim says that this this kind of epistemological naturalism of of Kitcher and Goldman is actually not very close to Quine's naturalized epistemology um, because he thinks the um, the Kitcher and, and Goldman version um, maintains the normativity, whereas Quine wants to get rid of it. So, you know, it's actually closer to the Cartesian tradition in that way. Cartesian tradition, tradition also maintaining the normative element of knowledge. Um, well, I mean, we might, we might question this. Um, I do remember showing you a quote from Bonjour where he just sort of rather high-handedly dismisses externalism saying, um, what does he say? Basically, it's just kind of beside the point or, you know, it's sort of an irrelevant distraction or something like that. And it's, it's not really talking about knowledge at all. Um, I always thought that by that he meant that it was kind of missing this normative element. I mean, who cares whether um, the belief is formed by a reliable cognitive process or something like that, that doesn't make it a good belief. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's justified or you know, likely to be, well, it is likely to be true in some sense, but it's not sort of well-founded in the, in the right way for it to be knowledge. Okay, so one could certainly question whether the externalist views, well, might depend on which externalism you have in mind, but whether externalism uh, generally uh, does maintain this normative element whether justified belief on these views is should have that positive evaluation or the right kind of positive evaluation. Yeah. Um, so, of course, uh, Goldman does maintain the word justified. He does say that, uh, you know, he defines a justified belief in terms of um, one being uh, one that is produced by a reliable process. But sometimes people might keep the name, but you know, empty of its meaning at the same time. You know, so the fact that he uses the word doesn't mean that he's actually maintained the something like the original sense of that word. Um, yeah, um, and process reliabilism does differ from traditional sort of internalist epistemology um, in that it analyzes this normative concept, justification, and it doesn't use any other epistemic terms or even, even any other normative terms 
uh, to define it. So, I mean, the, the concept of a reliable cognitive process is just one that um, produces truth most of the time. Well, I guess truth is a normative concept, so at least there's that, but um, it's basically only used as scientific concepts. Um, so that's, that's kind of something unusual. Um, I mean, often we say, you know, with Hume that you cannot derive an ought from an is, that is, or you can't just, def, uh, you can't derive a, an evaluative or normative statement from a purely descriptive one. You can't get prescriptions from descriptions. Um, the facts themselves never tell you what you ought to do. Um, you have to bring your own values um, into, this, into the premises before you get that. Anyway, so maybe it seems suspicious that um, apparently a normative concept like Goldman's justification here um, can be defined in terms of non-normative ones like reliability. Um, Kim doesn't see a problem here. He says, yeah, yeah you can get um, these normative concepts from purely, as it were, natural or, or scientific ones. No problem at all. Um, now, this argument of Kim's is not that easy to understand. And I think myself that it doesn't work. But um, anyway, don't worry too much. <laughs> If you, if you don't perfectly understand this. I had sort of this argument in mind when I was saying that maybe this uh, stuff wouldn't be on the final exam um, because it is a little tricky. Anyway, I'll do my best to try and explain the argument here. Um, okay, so um, supervenience. Um, Kim, you know, to argue that actually you can get normative concepts analyzed in terms of um, non-normative ones, um, relies on his notion of supervenience. Now I say his notion, I don't know if he invented it, but he's certainly the philosopher who's associated most with supervenience. Um, he wrote early papers on it uh, that are kind of canonical. Um, when, when you mention Jaguan Kim, most philosophers will immediately think of supervenience, okay? He's kind of Mr. Supervenience, you might say, Dr. Supervenience. Um, okay, so, um, there's kind of a strong and weak form of naturalism. Um, the first one, the sort of uh, stronger kind of naturalism, says that um, any term that is meaningful, um, and let's say terms like good and right, naturalistic, sorry, um, normative terms uh, like justified or you know, good belief, knowledge, and so on, any such terms that are meaningful have to be definable. You have to give the meanings of those terms on the basis of uh, naturalistic terms, purely descriptive ones, scientific terms. So that's a kind of reductionist claim, which um, many people think is a, is a step too far. That's kind of like Hume's uh, deriving an ought from an is. But Kim wants to endorse something a bit weaker than that, where um, epistemology doesn't provide a, a definition, but merely conditions or criteria for these normative terms, um, like justification and knowledge, in descriptive or naturalistic terms. And providing conditions or criteria relies on a relation of what uh, is called supervenience um, between the, the naturalistic talk and the uh, evaluative talk. Okay. Um, and so G. E. Moore expresses this supervenience by this, this uh, sentence here that if a thing is good, then it's being good follows from the fact that it possesses certain natural properties. Um, or um, yeah, here's another way to put it. So the supervenience of epistemic properties like knowledge and justification on naturalistic ones, things like, you know, how the belief was formed um, in relation to other objects in the environment, things like that. Um, we believe in this supervenience of uh, normative properties on naturalistic ones. Um, and the usual way that's put is that um, if two persons or, or two acts or two beliefs or whatever coincide in all their um, scientific or naturalistic details, they can't differ 
with respect to being good or bad or justified or unjustified. Okay, so here's an example. Suppose, um, you know, it's an art class and, um, you know, somebody paints uh, an exact copy, exact copy of the Mona Lisa. Now, um, you know, uh, I'm not saying it's going to have to be worth as much as the Mona Lisa because, you know, people might pay for more for the original because it was painted by Leonardo, whoever it was. Um, but you certainly can't say that the original Mona Lisa is, is beautiful um, and the copy is ugly, right? Because they're, they're physically identical, that if, if one is beautiful, then the other must also be, be beautiful. They can't differ in their pro beauty properties without differing in their physical properties and their, their physical properties are, are identical. Um, or, you know, if, if one person has a car and another person has a physically identical, identical car in all respects, um, it can't be that one car is a good car and the other is a bad one, right? Even though those are evaluative properties, um, you know, like if one is um, good and the other is bad, it must be because the bad car is unreliable or ugly or has lumpy seats or something, but all of those would require a, a physical difference between the cars. Okay, so that's, that's um, the basic idea that the normative should supervene on natural properties. It should be determined by, follow from the natural properties. All right, so um, we can apply then that idea to um, normative ideas in epistemology like justification. Um, so if something is a justified belief, that can't be a fundamental fact. Um, or let's say one belief is justified and another one is unjustified. That can't be the only difference between those two beliefs. There must be other sort of natural differences. Maybe one was uh, caused by a reliable process and the other was caused by an unreliable process. One was caused by the uh, corresponding fact and the other one wasn't. Um, things like this, okay? Um, right. Um, I mean, it, I, I'm reminded here of uh, Salvador Dali's um, statement that the only difference between himself and a madman is that he's not mad, okay? And again, this sort of violates supervenience. Um, you know, madness can't be a sort of a fundamental property. It would have to supervene on other things like... Um, you know, having uh, beliefs that correspond to reality or something, you know, like a madman generally is sort of delusional and, you know, has beliefs that um, aren't in step with reality. And so, um, you know, if one man is, is mad, another one isn't, they must differ with respect to their, um, re you know, the reliability of their beliefs or something like that, right? Okay. Um, yeah, so this term supervenience you can think of it as being grounded on or being determined by or, you know, that kind of thing. All right. Now, um, so Kim makes a decent case that justification ought to supervene on natural properties. Um, but does that exactly make it a natural property? I mean, it might seem so that if something supervenes on natural properties, then that makes it a natural property. But, you know, I want to look at a couple of cases that certainly um, seem to suggest that it isn't, okay? So first consider this um, property that's really an evaluative property, the property of conforming. Um, you know, if a, if a building specter comes over your, to your house during a, um, a reno job, it might tell you that these stairs are not conforming or this plumbing work is, is not conforming. Um, that means that it doesn't conform to the um, local building bylaws um, or the building codes and things like that. Okay. Um, now, in a sense, this property of conforming um, supervenes on its physical properties, uh, despite what it says in here on the slide. I mean, there's, there's a sense in which it does. That if you kind of keep the um, building bylaw fixed, that is, you don't take into account changes in the bylaws over time and, and between one city or one province and the next. Um, you know, within, within, a, within a single city, let's say Vancouver, 
at um, a single time, a single year, um, two physically identical properties. Um, actually, that's not even true, is it? They could be in different zoning. Anyway, <laughs> ignore zoning for, for a moment. Uh, two, two properties that are physically identical um, must be also the same with respect to whether or not they're conforming. You know, if, if one building conforms to the, to the building by law, then uh, another um, physically identical building in the next block also conforms. And, you know, the same thing with not conforming, right? So there's a kind of supervenience, but, um, but it's not a sort of a full supervenience because of the fact that the, the, the building bylaws are not necessary truths, and so they can vary. Um, you know, in another possible world or just a, a decade ago um, or a decade into the future, a building with the same physical properties would be non-conforming, right? Um, so, you know, the property of conforming is not a purely physical property. It's at least in part a political property because it depends on, you know, um, what uh, the politicians decide to do with regard to the bylaw, um, you know, members of the city council and so on. All right, um, but um, the next example is similar, except that the kind of standard that things are being held to is not the, um, you know, the Vancouver building bylaw, but uh, God's nature, which is, you know, according to theologians, uh, logically necessary. Okay, so suppose we have a rather crude theistic account, theistic account of moral goodness here is, you know, something like, um, uh, you know, uh, a character trait is a good trait, like courage or like goodness or, or rather um, like generosity or honesty or something. It's a good trait if it conforms to God's nature, if, if God is like that, okay? Um, interestingly then, because um, <clears throat> of the logical necessity of God's nature, and th I think this example is, is sort of useful conceptually, whether or not God really exists or not, uh, that's not the point. Um, would goodness count as a natural property here? Because, um, you know, we, we can assume that, um, well, we don't even need to assume anything, that if one person is honest um, and another person is honest, you know, um, both of those are gonna be morally good because both of them conform to um, God's nature. So, um, you're never going to find a case where, you know, two people are alike in their sort of natural properties, things like honesty or, you know, whether they have a propensity to um, give away their things or whether they want to hold on tight to them. You know, these kinds of natural properties, if they are the same with respect to their natural properties, then on this view of goodness, they're also going to be the same in, in terms of their moral properties. Um, if one conforms to God's nature, the other one will conform to God's nature also to the exact same extent. Um, so we have the supervenience that Kim is talking about here, the supervenience of normative properties on natural properties. And yet clearly moral goodness is not a natural property on this account because uh, you know, God is involved in, in its definition. So um, supervenience is not the same as reduction. I think this is a nice example that shows the difference between supervenience and reduction. If you're reducing everything to non-natural properties, then you can actually define them in terms of purely natural uh, objects, whereas super, uh, supervenience actually will allow you to define something in terms of supernatural objects, um, as it does here. Okay, so... Um, so Kim is trying to sh tell us um, that normative epistemology is actually consistent with naturalism. And his, his argument is that there must be naturalistic criteria of um, justified belief and other terms like that, like knowledge and whatnot, even warrant, um, because epistemic properties have to supervene on natural ones. Um, but... Um, you know, the example I just gave of, um, you know, defining good in terms of God's nature. And I think, you know, even the building bylaw one, it's easy to mistake 
um, things that sort of stay the same and apply everywhere, things like the laws of physics, for example, it's um, easy to sort of regard them as necessary. And then um, if you do that, then it'll at least seem that um, you get more supervenience than, than you actually get. You know, like, so if you don't know that building bylaws change, for, for example, you might easily say that whether or not a building is conforming uh, supervenes on its physical properties, right? So, um, you know, maybe epistemology does in fact have to be defined in terms of God. I mean, as, as for example, planting of things. Um, in that case, um, you know, we, we might, you know, and, and even if it's aspects of God that are not uh, logically necessary, not every aspect of God is, for example, it might depend on God's choices or, you know, something like that. Um, God, God's intentions or something. Um, even in those cases, we, so in, in those kinds of cases, we're going to mistakenly think we have supervenience of, of um, uh, epistemological normative concepts like justification on natural ones, right? So um, it doesn't seem that he's given any real argument here to rule his kind of case out. So there really isn't any evidence that uh, epistemic properties are natural. No evidence here given by Kim. For example, I mean, planting is view of warrant, which is sort of explicitly supernatural in the end. He, he kind of tries to be ne neutral on that through most of his book, but eventually comes out as a theist and thinks that theism is actually needed for his theory of warrant to work. So he has an explicitly supernaturalist account of warrant um, that Kim doesn't really seem to, you know, um, be aware of such possibilities in his argument here. Okay, um, so that's, that's, you know, Kim in a nutshell. Um, a fairly tricky argument there. Um, I won't be too disappointed if <laughs> nobody wants to talk about that, but I would be happy to uh, discuss it with anyone um, tomorrow who is, who is interested. Um, now, um, Feldman, in his chapter on this, um, ends with um, a pretty important and sort of practical question here. To what extent does epistemology need or perhaps profit from uh, empirical research? Um, now, he considers an argument that really, um, that, you know, epistemology um, can't really add anything at all to scientific research, that it sort of uh, only has empirical uh, information and that's, that's, uh, and that's all. Um, so the argument goes like this, it's kind of a fork here, that knowledge we have in epistemology or anywhere is either a priori, that is analytic, or um, a posteriori, scientific. Um, notice how they're sort of leaving out the possibility of um, um, you know, and, uh, a priori and synthetic knowledge, but anyway. Um, so a priori knowledge on this um, argument is, is pretty vacuous. It's just, well, certainly analytic knowledge, they would say, uh, empiricists say, is just, you know, true by convention. It's like saying A is equal to A or um, all fish are fish, that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, if epistemology is not relying on the scientific data, if it's just using a priori knowledge, then it's basically vacuous. And so if we're gonna get anywhere at all in epistemology, um, if we're gonna have more than just tautologies in our, uh, in our theories, we need scientific knowledge, okay? So we just can't do without empirical research. Um, yeah, so again, I, I just mentioned this, that Feldman in this argument assumes that a priori knowledge only gives us um, analytic statements, uh, like all bachelors are married, which I think isn't true. But um, anyway, so how does Feldman respond to this? Um, well, he, he certainly um, agrees with it somewhat. Um, he thinks that we certainly, epistemologists, we need to pay attention to um, what the psychologists are finding. Um, 
and it's hard to argue with that, right? If, if there's somebody who's doing work in at least a related field where there's some crossover, um, of course you should pay attention to what they find out. Um, you know, we should um, pay attention to these results, they're relevant, these results should be given their proper due. Um, okay, it's hard to argue with that. Um, but he thinks that the philosopher, you know, again, contrary to Quine's claim that there's no first philosophy, that there's really only um, empirical science, he thinks there's another category of knowledge in addition to a priori analytic knowledge and, and empirical scientific knowledge that he calls armchair knowledge. Um, sounds very comfortable. Um, given the choice between the armchair and the lab, I know what I would pick. But anyway, what is this armchair knowledge? Um, well, it's, it is a posteriori, okay? So it does come from experience, but it's not, um, it doesn't require, you know, complicated equipment, expensive apparatus, okay? It's just sort of everyday experiences, just experiences of, you know, perception and, and memory and experiences of reasoning, things like that, okay? Experiences of qualia, you know, if you think of that argument of uh, you know Jackson and Nagel that sort of supposedly tells us that materialism is false, um, it comes just from the premise that we have um, in the mind uh, experiences of you know qualities like the color of a tomato and you know the smell of coffee and so on, and uh, it also seems that those experiences can't be sort of defined in terms of structure and dynamics. You, know, you can't define them in terms of, you know, physical particles and motion, things like that. Anyway, so that's the kind of thing that Feldman is talking about here. Um, and that's, you know, I think that's a point worth making too, that we might be able to get so far with epistemology, for example, and other areas of philosophy, just by reflecting carefully and rigorously on common experience um, no doubt, you know, more detailed and, and uh, sophisticated experiences like you get from setting up experiments and observing the results. That's also useful, but um, you might be able to get a certain way without um, even doing that. Okay, so again, I'd be curious to see what you think, but I will stop here. Okay, hopefully see you tomorrow.